जय श्री प्रभुपाद की जय श्री श्री राधा माधव की जय श्री हरि नाम संकीर्तन की जय श्री वृंदावन धाम की जय श्रीमद भागवत गीता की जय निधाई गोविंद प्रेम ओम ज्ञान चिन्हनंदनाशलाकया चक्षुन्मेदीताम्येनाश्रीगुरव नम श्री चैतन्य मनोभीष्टा नोतम स्वयं रूपकदाई हम दधाति स्वपदी का जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभो निनंद श्री अद्वैत गाधर श्री वासादि गौर भक्त मिंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे हरे राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 मुखम करोति वाचन पंगम लंगयत यत्पात महामंदे Welcome to chapter three of the Bhagavad Gita. As Kritika said, this is Karma Yoga. Um, <coughs> <coughs> the art of uh, dedicating what's one's activities and uh, particularly the fruit of one's activities to lord vishnu who is none other than krishna um so as we know in these uh, six chapters krishna is describing the progressive path of elevation how we can progressively uh, purify our consciousness and uh, return to our original position as as an eternal servant of krishna so there is a path which is considered the gradual path the path that we are following as devotees of krishna shri prabhat called it the direct Path. Sometimes he compared it to a, an elevator in a building. You get in the elevator on level one, you press a button, and you come out on level ten, very quickly. Uh, but what is being described from uh, in the in the first six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, it's not the elevator system; it is the staircase. So when you go by the staircase, first you reach the first floor, and then the second floor, and then the third floor, and then the fourth floor, like that, all the way to floor number ten. So it is a system, a, a process which is slower. Uh, it's slower, and it goes in stages. So we have already heard from the Bhagavad Gita that. the lowest form of activity is sinful activity wherein uh, a human being just indulges in enjoying the senses without any restriction and uh, this kind of activities are not uh, just a um, <coughs> favorable they yield very painful reactions so um there is always a question which comes back again and again in the mind of people that if activities bring painful reactions then shouldn't we just stop acting should just we just shouldn't we just stay quiet and not do anything because anything we do brings uh the burden of karma bandhana bondage by work but krishna in the bhagavad gita never speaks in favor 
of inaction, which he says is very, very unnatural because the soul, the living entity, um, is an active, is active by nature. There is an active principle in the soul and the soul cannot stop acting. <laughs> it is its nature to be always doing something. So we cannot artificially stop ourselves from uh, doing something. Uh, you can try, like some people try to practice mauna vrata, hmm? which means no talking. How long do they last usually? You can try. You can try to practice mauna vrata and see how long you last. You will see that there will be an urge coming from within, the urge to speak. And this is called vacho vegam. So it's like this for everything. Try fasting. We are fasting on Janmashtami. We are fasting on certain days. What happens when you are fasting? Oh, you feel so hungry. You remember, yeah, that there is a there is an urge for eating. Uh, so any activities actually are very difficult to stop. And as long as we are alive, as long as the body uh, is functioning, and as long as the soul inhabits the body, the body will be acting. So the Bhagavad Gita is teaching us how to work without reaction. And, and the, the process goes from work, whimsical work, without any restriction. That is called vikarma, or sinful life. Then it goes to pious work, which is regulated and according to the rules and regulations of the Shastra, but which has as its aim simply enjoying life. So this is this, the, the, the path of karma, karma itself, pious activity. Now in chapter three, we have come to another level. We are now practically on the third floor. And uh, this is the art of acting according to the rules and regulations of the Shastra, but not just for oneself understanding that there is a supreme controller, Lord Vishnu. And that um, if we want to be free from the results of activities, understanding that impious activities lead us to suffering and pious activities, according to Shastra, they lead us to enjoyment in the next life. However, one who becomes intelligent understands that if there is a next life, it means that there is a, and they know that the next life is not in the same body because this body will die. So it means that there is something which continues from one body to the next, from one life to the next. What is this thing? So the intelligent understand what continues from one life to the next, that's me. <laughs> It is me, the soul. I transmigrate and I go from body to body to body to body. And both pious and impious activities are going to yield reactions which are going to create my next body, either a body of suffering or a body of enjoyment. So karma yoga is the beginning of a different uh, path. Uh, it's the beginning of turning towards a different direction. Karma and Vikarma are the path of samsara, remaining in this world. But when we come to Karma Yoga, it means we are starting to look upwards, like the tilak that we wear. This is called Urdhva which means upwards, Urdhva Pundra, the mark which is going upwards. 
what is the meaning of this? It means that we have accepted the path of elevation. And this path of elevation, it actually begins with Karma Yoga. Karma Yoga implies uh, acting according to the principles. Here uh, it says we will read the principles uh, of Varnashra in general. Hmm? Uh, for the purpose of purification and the purpose of elevation. So we are going to read this verse here. We are in verse 34, which actually speaks of the stumbling blocks on the path of elevation. There are some stumbling blocks, means some obstacles. We decide, oh, okay, I shall walk up the path of liberation. But once we start, we discover that there are stumbling blocks. It's not so easy. So what those stumbling blocks are, we are going to read them in this verse. 34. Indriya syendriya syarthe ranga dvesha vyavastitha tayorana vasamagatche tohyasya paripanthina Srila Prabhupada translates, there are principles to regulate attachment and aversion pertaining to the senses and their objects. One should not come under the control of such attachment and aversion because they are stumbling blocks on the path of self-realization. So what are the stumbling blocks? What are the obstacles on the path of self-realization? We, there are two mentioned here, Raga and Dvesha. Raga means attraction or attachment. We have attachments. It's like somebody who is habituated to smoking cigarettes. And then suddenly he decides, from tomorrow I am not smoking. Is it going to happen? Very difficult. The next day he will still have the determination, no, no, I'm not smoking anymore, I'm not smoking anymore, I'm not smoking anymore. But Raga. There is an attachment which has built by association with the cigarettes for many, many, many years. And so there will be struggle. There will be an obstacle uh, to being free or to remaining free from smoking. The person is going to struggle and struggle. No, just one, just one. Okay, just one, just one. There will be um, a calling from within. That is very difficult. And similarly, there is dvesha. So these are actually the activities of the mind. The mind has two functions. Uh, uh, acceptance and rejection. Acceptance follows raga, something that we are attracted to, the indriyartha. The indriyartha are the sense objects. So we are attracted to strawberry jam, we are attracted to smoking, we are attracted to so many things, sightseeing, whatever it be. So we are attracted to certain things. And because we are attracted, the, the attachment, the attraction overwhelms our determination. It overwhelms our intelligence. And then there is the other side, some things we don't like, we don't want, we are averse to them. And so there it says attachment and hatred. Some things we just don't like, we just don't want, we just don't like. And that, but that is all on the mental plane. It's on the mental and sensual plane. Not very intelligent. So the Karma Yoga will teach us how to go beyond the mind. Karma Yoga is actually the beginning of Buddha Yoga connecting one's intelligence to the Supreme, making the Supreme as one's goal. 
So there are principles to regulate attachment and aversion pertaining to the senses and their objects. And these are found in the Shastra. Actually, regulating the senses and controlling the mind is the first goal of all the different practices of yoga. You take karma yoga, you take jnana yoga, you take ashtanga yoga. The first goal of all these yogas is to control the mind and the senses in different ways. Karma yoga controls the mind and senses by engaging the mind and senses in activities. Jnana yoga controls the mind and senses by engaging in contemplation, speculation, reflections on the nature of the world. And then Ashtanga Yoga controls the minds and senses through mechanical uh, practice. The practice of breathing in and out and in and out. If you ever try it, as soon as you control the breath, the breathing process, immediately the mind quietens down. One should not come under the control of the, such uh, attachment and aversion. They are very dangerous. They keep us in this material world. So we heard already that karma yoga is based on duty. Raga and Vesha, they are born from Rajaguna. We will read this in a couple of verses. And Tamaguna, Dvesha, means hatred, anger. It usually is born from, it, is, it has a tinge of tamas, of ignorance. And the attachment, the attraction, that is born from the mode of passion. Whereas following the rules and regulations, uh, following one's duty, that is born from the mode of goodness. So karma yoga is there to elevate the people to the mode of goodness. And it is a process like this, but that because from the moment of goodness, then one attains knowledge. So, and you reach the next floor on the process of advancement. You just reach the next floor. Then you are on the level of jnana, uh, in which you, you start understanding the nature of things. You can see the nature of things simply by the enlightenment which is given by the word of goodness. But that is not all. One must continue to elevate oneself until the path, until the goal of transcendence is achieved. Let us read some of the purport here, what Srila Prabhupada says. Those who are in Krishna consciousness are naturally reluctant to engage in material sense gratification. So this is the first sentence. What does it say? That those people who have already develop Krishna consciousness, who are attracted to Krishna, who remember Krishna mm, all throughout the day, who are fixed mm, in thinking of the Lord, and who do not want at any time to do anything that displeases Him. So those who have advanced in Krishna consciousness, for them, uh, Attraction to sense object is out of question. It doesn't come because the, being in Krishna consciousness means that we have already we have already developed attachment for Krishna. So if we have attachment from Krish, for Krishna, that attachment will burn our attraction for material things. So those who are advanced in Krishna consciousness, for them, it is natural to be detached. They never think of going to the cinema. They just don't think about it. They do not need, they are not attracted. You can show them some beautiful cake, for example. You show them a cake, you show a cake to a devotee, a beautiful cake. Is the devotee going to say, mm -hmm. no, the devotee is going to say, is it offered? 
is it prasadam? And if it is prasadam, mm, I'd like to have some. And if it is not prasadam, the entire attraction to the cake, which is an indriya artha, it's an object of the sense, particularly of the tongue, it makes no sense anymore. So those who are Krishna conscious, for them there is no difficulty staying away from material attachment. But not everyone um, has that kind of level of understanding. So here Prabhupada says, now you can see the first sentence is about those who are Krishna conscious. And a little bit advanced. So who are not interested in anything but Krishna. For them, attraction, repulsion, it's not according, it's not self-centered. See, the, in the conditioned state, the attraction and repulsion is according to me. I like, I'm attracted, I want it. I don't like, keep it up. But for devotees, hmm, the attraction and repulsion is there also, but it is not according to what I want or I don't want. It's according to what Krishna wants and Krishna doesn't want. So if it's prasadam, I, uh, the attraction is, will come. Yes, I want. And if it's not prasadam, no interest, gone. Because the attraction and repulsion is connected to Krishna. So we have to make that transfer. But now we talk of another kind of people. Those who are not in such consciousness should follow the rules and regulations of the revealed scriptures. In other words, those for those who are Krishna conscious, it is spontaneous. They are attracted to Krishna, not to Maya, spontaneously. But for those who do not have that spontaneity, then there are rules and regulations to help. To help us stay out of trouble. Unrestricted sense enjoyment is the cause of material engagement. But one who follows the rules and regulations of the revealed scriptures does not become entangled by the sense objects. And the rules and regulations here, of course, can vary from what at which stage one is. Like in Karma Yoga, there are rules and regulations. In Jnana Yoga, there are rules and regulations. In Ashtanga Yoga, there are rules and regulations. And in Bhakti Yoga too, there are rules and regulations. <clears throat> so anyone who follows the rules and regulations as laid down in the Shastra for a particular stage, that person is safe. And if one does not follow, then one becomes a victim of the mind, of being controlled by the mind and by the mode of ignorance and the mode of passion. And one acts whimsically. Um, so Srila Prabhupada gives an example. He says, for example, sex enjoyment is a necessity for the conditioned soul. Uh, this is like the most difficult topic out of all the sense objects. Mm -hmm. Uh, which pertains, some sense object pertains to the tongue, some sense object pertains to the nose, some people are addicted to perfumes, mm. uh, some people like to hear beautiful songs, that is the sense of the ear, some people like to see beautiful pictures, beautiful things, that is the sense of sight. Uh, but Generally, in this material world, the topmost enjoyment is sex enjoyment. And so Prabhupada takes this as an example uh, that he says that uh, sex enjoyment is allowed under the license of marriage ties. So this is the regulation. Mm -hmm. These are the rules of Vanashram Dharma that up to the age of 25, 
uh, one is meant to remain a celibate. It can be 25 is an average age, uh, pertaining mostly to the to men actually. Uh, but this is the principles that in the youth, from childhood to teenage, and basically until one takes a decision to um, create a family, uh, to get married, then there should be celibacy. Of course, in this modern world, as soon as someone speaks like this, uh, one is known as a maybe old-fashioned, hmm? one will be known as old-fashioned. But that's not old-fashioned. This is eternal fashion. This is the law. Huh? Uh, this is the law of God. That intermingling between sexes um, has to be regulated. If it is not regulated, it will bring suffering. So here Prabhupada says that there is a regulation. What is the regulation for sex life? It is marriage. Hmm? When someone is married, we can engage in sex life. And that too. And there's some regulations. And if one is not married, then forget about sex life. So this is very important to understand because sex life is the Top more, it is the uh, thing which most entangles us in this material world. More than eating, more than, um, as I said, using all the different senses and engaging with all the different objects. Uh, for most of the people, this uh, is the most attractive feature of the world. And it is the most entangling also. It puts us in material consciousness. So therefore, there are rules and regulations. According to the scriptural injunction, one is forbidden to engage in sex relationships with any woman other than one's wife. Okay. You can put it in the words of women, that women are not allowed to engage in sexual activity with anyone else but their husband. So the spouse, one has to be married. This is the Varashram Dharma, from Brahmachari life to Grihastha life. And then after Grihastha life, there are two more ashramas, Vanaprastha and Sannyasis, and those two more ashramas are also without sex life. In the Vedic understanding, in the Vedic society, the society created by Krishna, uh, Chaturvarnyam Maya Shrestha. It says, I've created these four. Varnas, Krishna also created the four ashramas. And um, out of these four, sex life is allowed only in the Grihastha ashram, nowhere else. In the other ashrams, it is equal to vikarma. It becomes a sinful activity. So here, um, all other women are to be considered as one's mother. This is the recommendation which is given to men that to see all women as mother. Uh, this is meaning, that means to give respect. It means to respect. Mother usually is a figure which is um, a figure of authority. It's a figure which is higher than us. We look up at the mother for her advice, for her care, for her protection. Um, and usually the relationship between men and women, um, it clicks when the man takes a superior position and the woman follows. As soon as that combination comes, then immediately there is a sexual intent, usually. It's natural, it just works like this. But as soon as the man, instead of looking down at the woman, starts looking up at the mother, then this natural attraction, this sexual energy is cut. It is cut. Because now you are looking at 
a woman, but uh, she's not the figure of enjoyment. She's the personification of nourishment. She also personifies authority. So one time one lady asked Srila Prabhupada that all men are supposed to look at women as their mother. So how are we women supposed to look at men? Are we supposed to look at them as our father? <laughs> uh, Brava said, no. If you are his mother, who is, she for, who is he for you? And Prabhupada gave the Hindi uh, word, he said, beta. <laughs> <laughs> so if you are in a situation in which you see that some man is developing some kind of attraction for you. If you want to cut it nicely, you say, yes, Bitta. <laughs> Similarly for men, if you see that the lady is developing some attraction, <laughs> you say, yes, mother. And when you introduce the relationship of mother and son, then immediately the sexual energy has no place. It, it, it doesn't know where to flow. It cannot flow anymore. So this is the Vedic culture. It is very scientific. And we should learn these things and stay out of trouble. So here, but in spite of such injunctions, after hearing so many good instructions, a man is still inclined to have sex relationship with other women. These propensities are to be curbed. Curb means they have to be controlled. Otherwise, they will be stumbling blocks on the path of liberation. First, there is attraction, and then after some time, there is repulsion. This is the whole story of the modern society. Love marriage followed by divorce. That is Raga Dvesha. Raga Dvesha. Attraction, repulsion. Attraction, repulsion. So this verse says this is not the way to go. We should not fall under attraction and we should not fall under repulsion. Everything we do in life should be on the principle of duty with a higher goal in mind than just immediate enjoyment. We have learned already in the Bhagavad Gita the difference between shreyas and prayas. Prayas means immediate benefit. And shreyas means long-term benefit. So sometimes we have to sacrifice a little bit of enjoyment for a long-term benefit. Srila Prabhupada always many times says that sense gratification, which is born of raga, uh, goes ill with self-realization. The two don't go together. For self-realization, in other words, for spiritual elevation, uh, sense gratification has to be curbed. As long as the material body is there, the necessities of the material body are allowed, but under rules and regulations. One should not act out of attraction and repulsion. One should follow rules and regulations. And yet, we should not rely upon the control of such allowances. One has to follow those rules and regulations unattached to them. Because practice of sense gratification and the regulations may also lead one to go astray as much as there is always the chance of an accident even on the royal road. So do we understand here that actually the trouble is the spirit of enjoyment. Krishna is the only enjoyer. But we mistakenly identify ourselves as the enjoyer. And that spirit of enjoyment 
is be behind the raga, dvesha. If I feel good with something, raga, I'm attracted. If I don't feel good with something, dvesha, I don't want it. I'm repulsed by it. So it's all based on the spirit of enjoyment. If I can enjoy it, I want it. If it doesn't feel enjoyable, I don't want it. Who am I? I am the supreme enjoyer. I'm in that spirit. And that spirit is very cunning. That spirit is very sticky. And here Srila Prabhupada says that we have to be very careful. Even when we follow the rules and regulations, we should be careful that we follow the rules and regulations with detachment. So this is the progress through Karma Yoga. There are two phases in Karma Yoga. There is something called Sakam Karma Yoga and another is called Nishkam Karma Yoga, which means that initially a person is trying to work with detachment, but Sakam means there is no, the detachment is not there yet. And therefore, there is a mixture of sense enjoyment and sacrifice to Vishnu. I said sometimes you have a hundred mangoes on the tree or a hundred avocados. You have a hundred avocados on the tree. And uh, you understood that karma yoga means you have to sacrifice a portion of these uh, to the Lord for your own benefits, for your own elevation. But you like avocados so much and there is some raga, raga is there. So initially, hmm, you will give 10 avocados to the temple and enjoy the other 90 with great, uh, what do you say, attraction. But because you follow the principle of sacrifice, yagyartha kuru karmani, one should act for the benefit of yagya, of Supreme Law. So gradually, eh, there will be a purification and the raga, the attraction, will diminish. And gradually, gradually, you will see that the person will start giving 50% of the avocados to the temple. And then gradually he'll be giving 70%. And gradually, gradually the raga will not be there. And we'll begin the idea of nishkam karma, by which we will be performing one's uh, activities, we'll be performing one's activities, usually in Varnashram Dharma, but without the taste for sense gratification without the attachment. So this attachment, and this, which is born from the desire to enjoy, this is what has to be purified. It has to be purified. It's not just a question of following the rules and regulations, no. The purpose always has to be kept in mind and one has to make an effort to fix the mind on the Lord and uh, to curb this spirit of enjoyment. So Prabhupada also explains this is because of this example that he has given here of married life, that in married life, for example, there is a rule and regulation that sex life is allowed once a month. So Prabhupada explains that, that the couple is eagerly waiting for that day. So on one hand, they follow the rules and regulations, but the attachment is still there. Eagerly waiting for that day when we can enjoy. So that's what Prabhupada said, that we have to be very careful that you should not continue in that spirit. Because otherwise, there will be an accident just as there can be an accident on the highway or on the royal road. Royal road means it's very well maintained, it is straight. Normally, you cannot have any accident on a good road. Accidents happen when there are curves, when there are very narrow roads, 
bumpy roads, then it's easy to have an accident. But when the road is very well maintained, very straight, very clear, then why should there be an accident? But yes, there can always be an accident if the driver falls asleep. So similarly, while following the regulations, and this does not apply only for karma yoga, but it applies also in bhakti yoga. Any rules and regulations that we follow, which are meant to purify us, we should follow them for the purpose of attaining detachment, for the purpose of reaching a higher uh, spiritual status. Not that we just use the rule and regulation to continue enjoying forever. This will not liberate us from this uh, material world. So there is this danger here mm, that uh, the practice of sense gratification and the regulations may also lead to go astray. Now, um, Srila Prabhupada said, the sense enjoyment spirit has been current a very long, long time owing to material association. We studied in chapter two. Uh, what, how does the attraction arise? What was it? Anyone remembers that verse? Dhyayato vishayan pum sam sangas teshu pajayate sangat sanjayate kama kama krodhu jayate. You remember? This was the sequence of fall down, actually. How we become involved with the material nature. Where does it start? Dhyan. We contemplate the objects. You just look at it. You just contemplate. You look at it, you think about it. And then slowly, slowly comes Sangha. Sangha means Raga. Attachment. There is some attraction. And then the spirit of enjoyment is cultivated through that association. The spirit of enjoyment, karma, grows. And then there is a whole cycle by which you try to enjoy. And if you manage to enjoy and, and get some pleasure out of whatever object you could catch, uh, uh, instead of leaving you peaceful, no. The karma increases more and more and more and more. And if by chance you don't manage to enjoy that object, then comes dvesha. Then you hate it. You become angry. Kroda. You become angry. And this anger will completely overcast the intelligence, will put you in illusion, and gradually, 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 you fall to a hellish condition, losing your memory, losing your intelligence, losing all your good sense of judgment. So we have studied this. This is the danger. Uh, but the spirit of enjoyment has been current in us for a very, very long time. What do we mean by very, very long time? Srila Prabhupada said we have been in this material world for millions of years. That's a whole lot of a lifetime. We have been in human bodies. We have been in beasts' bodies. We have been in birds' bodies. We might have been in worm bodies, who knows? We have been in tree bodies, plant bodies, fish bodies, in so many kinds of bodies. And in all these bodies, we came in contact with the material objects. We experienced the taste, 
matras parsha stukanteya. The matras parsha, the, the touch with the material object, has been recorded in our memory. And strawberry tastes like this. Blackberry tastes like that. We have a whole bank of records of sense pleasure in our memory. And because the soul desires enjoyment by nature, then we are attracted to different things. And because we remember the pleasure that they give. So, <clears throat> so this spirit of enjoy enjoyment um, is very, very difficult to give up. Prabhupada continues. Um, Any attachment for regulated sense enjoyment must also be avoided by all means. So these were two paths. There's the impious path of the vikarmis, and then there is the pious path of the karmis, and then the karma yogis who are still attached, the sakkam karma yogis. But then Prabhupada again switches. You have to learn how to read this in Prabhupada's purpose. We said the first sentence was about Krishna conscious people who are naturally not attracted to anything but Krishna Prasad. Anything related to Krishna, they are attracted. Anything not related to Krishna, they are they, not attracted very naturally. They don't have to push themselves. Then all the middle that we just read was all about karma yoga. And now Prabhupada goes back to Krishna consciousness because Srila Prabhupada always preaches direct, the direct path of Krishna consciousness throughout the Bhagavad Gita. Even though here, Krishna is talking of Karma Yoga, Srila Prabhupada will always bring it back to Krishna consciousness and explain that if you take up Krishna consciousness, you don't need to do all these things. And it is a process which is so powerful that it will take care of all your attachments. So here he says, but, but means we are changing topic here. Just a position. But attachment to Krishna consciousness or acting always in the loving service of Krishna detaches one from all kinds of sensory activities. So now we are talking of the process of Krishna consciousness. And that process detaches us of all kinds of sensory activities. How is that? Because we engage directly our senses in the service of Krishna. Voluntarily. Therefore, no one should try to be detached from Krishna consciousness at any stage of life. The whole purpose of detachment from all kinds of sense attachment is ultimately to become situated on the platform of Krishna consciousness. See, ultimately we want to become Krishna conscious. Um, so why not start today? There is no need. That's the final um, you say, lesson or advice of the Bhagavad Gita. Sarva dharma and parityaja ma me raja means you no need for this karma yoga, no need for jnana yoga, no need for dhyana yoga, ashtanga yoga, no need for any of this. Give up all these dharmas and simply take up the path of bhakti, surrender unto me. And I personally shall deliver you from all your sinful activities. Do not fear. So a devotee is fearless. A devotee is fearless because he completely relies on Krishna. It's like a child, Prabhupada says, who is crossing the road. There's a big road with lots of traffic, many cars, and a small child when he is alone, he doesn't even dare crossing the road. But when his father is with him and he's holding the hand of the father, 
very proudly he crosses the road fearlessly why because he's attached to the father and he has complete faith that my father is protecting me he doesn't have a sense of insecurity at all so this is the position of the devotee we hold down to krishna's doti we are thinking of him we are chanting his name we are working for him there is a big difference between performing karma yoga and performing bhakti yoga both are based on activity as we said krishna condemns the path of inactivity we should engage in activity but what kind of activity so we have two choices one is that you perform all your material duties and once it's done which basically material duties means it's for yourself it's for your maintenance you have to uh, earn some money you have to build something you have to build a house you have to build all these things so <clears throat> you do your karma mm -hmm. but uh, in order to advance spiritually and not become entangled by the work that you are performing <clears throat> you dedicate you offer the work to krishna so this is karma yoga you do something which you want to do which you like to do you do it and after doing it it's done then you remember krishna oh this is actually yours please let me offer it to you okay krishna consciousness is different krishna consciousness means before doing any activity remember krishna position yourself as the servant of krishna and act for him not for yourself karma yoga is activity performed for my own sake and then i offer it to krishna because i know it will purify and it will free me from the reactions and so on there is no love involved there and usually the platform of karma yoga is the platform of dehatma buddhi which means identification with the material body i believe that unless i work hard in this world i will starve this is ingrained i must work krishna says if you work for me i'll take care of you that's a different angle altogether krishna is the maintainer of all the living entities in two ways he maintains them indirectly those who are independent workers and who don't have a full understanding krishna maintains them by this whole system of karma they work they get the result they work they get the result they work they get the result and in this way they maintain themselves in this world that is indirect maintenance and then there is a system of direct maintenance that is for those who don't work for themselves but first of all understood that the self is the soul i am the soul and as a soul i am an eternal servant of the lord and my only business is to serve him so that is a completely different platform so when we become a devotee of krishna we have some way to go to attain that consciousness by which you know you don't work for your own maintenance but you only work for the pleasure of krishna and the activities of uh, bhakti yoga we know them they were told by prahlad maharaj to his father here in yakashipu shavanam kirtanam vishnu smaranam pada sevanam asanam vandanam dasyam sakyam atma divendanam this is what prahlad said these are 
the activities of Navavida Bhakti. You chant about the Lord, you hear about the Lord, you remember the Lord, you serve the lotus feet of the Lord, you offer uh, articles in worship of the Lord, mm -hmm. uh, you offer obeisances and prayers to the Lord, mm -hmm. uh, you become the servant of the Lord, mm -hmm. you, you execute his order, that is Dasyam. You execute the order of the Lord, you make friendship with the Lord, and you surrender everything to the Lord. And of course, the question will come. Hmm? Is this going to feed me? Is this going to fill my belly? Hmm? So it takes many lifetimes for a soul in the human body to develop the faith based on knowledge, to develop the faith that yes, it is sufficient to feed me. The Lord will, he will arrange everything for me. I just have to do his work. So that is the platform of pure devotional service. And we have to rise to that platform. It is a journey of consciousness which starts with karma yoga. I do my things and I give you a little bit because I'm attached to them. And then after some time, I do my things, I give you a little more. And to the point in which I do my things, but really I don't have any more interest for it. I fully detached. But detachment is not love. So to go to the platform of love, one has to change the process and move on to Bhakti Yuga. So we will stop here for the day. Shila Prabhupada, King Jai. Hare Krishna. Before you ask for a question, before Kritika gets a question, uh, I'll button as always, age before beauty. Uh, thank you for the wonderful uh, session, mind-blowing, uh, heart-enlightening, in, uh, hoping to be able to imbibe some of it. Can I just add a little hilarious thing to what you were saying? Love at first sight, divorce at first fight. <laughs> you know, this is something we always tell people, love at first sight and divorce at first fight. And the next one, some, some karmic thing I had read years back, marry in haste, regret at leisure. You know, <laughs> I mean, we don't have so many young girls who have joined us, but I always say it's better, go slow and uh, have a marriage which has been arranged rather than you decide for yourself. Now, my question, Prashanta Prabhuji, you know, you mentioned about aversion and attachments, right? Now, on the base, on the based on sense object, it's so simple because it's gross, easy to detect, and easy to dissect and try to improve. But what about the subtle one uh, when uh, you have this aversion and attachment towards devotee, and yet you understand very well Krishna always saying about samadarshi, and. Uh, you know, I always find this to be the most difficult uh, practice that can, I don't know, the victim of Hare Krishna. Okay, I don't know whether everyone could hear everything. It was a little hard to hear in the end, wasn't it? Yes, Nancy Ganga Mataji. But basically, the essence, I think, was what about attachment for devotees, uh, subtle attachments and all. Um, Krishna consciousness means we try to, we learn how to put Krishna in the middle. We hear 
of the activities of Ambarish Maharaj. He put all his senses in the service of Krishna. And with his arms, he embraced the devotees. So having affection for the devotees is not wrong. But you have to analyze whether the spirit of enjoyment is there, whether selfish attachment is there. You have to be careful that the weeds don't grow along with the log. Because Krishna is not alone. Huh? We are not loving Krishna alone. It's a kind of mayavad, Prabhupada says. We're not loving Krishna alone. We are not, um, uh, what was her name? Um, that lady from Rajasthan. Who got her name? Mira. Mira. Uh, Mira. Yeah, Mira. Mira, of course, she was a great devotee, but uh, her philosophy was to just love Krishna. But this is not uh, the philosophy in general of the Vaishnavas. We always see Krishna along with his devotees. So if we love Krishna, we also love his devotees. But we have to keep this in perspective that they are Krishna's, not mine. Huh? The Mamata uh, cannot be there. Nirmama. Nirmama, Nirahankara, this is the spirit of detachment. That possessiveness should not be there. Like we see sometimes people preach and after some time, you know, the people are mine. Uh, and they develop some kind of <clears throat> mamata over the people that they are cultivating. Um, of course, within a family, it's even more difficult Naturally, the mother says, what do you mean is not my son? <laughs> Can't believe it. No, actually, he's Krishna. So your son belongs to Krishna. Um, so we have to purify those attachments. But it's okay to love the devotees. Otherwise, who, who we will love? We cannot love Krishna alone. We have to start loving the people around us as well. So loving the devotees, we hear of the six loving exchanges. So these exchanges, Prabhupada explains, they are amongst the devotees and they are also between the devotee and the Lord. So we should practice the six exchanges of love. Dadati, Pratigranati, Gusha Makhyati, Prichati, Bhute, Bhojayate, Cheva. Shadvidam Priti Lakshanam, the, the manifestation of love, we should certainly uh, practice. We should offer gifts and accept gifts. We should open our mind, exchange our realizations, or reveal our anxieties. And we should similarly listen to other people's realizations we should help them counsel them when they are in trouble and then we should feed people we should be fed and in that way my relationship of love will grow only we have to be always introspective that is it love or is it lust lust means i profit from that i enjoy it and there is also something like, if I don't have that relationship, I can't exist. There is a dependence which is being created, which can be unhealthy. So we don't want to have this emotional dependence on devotees. But we want to love the devotees, be in the mood of giving them. And of course we have to love the devotees. I mean, devotees need love. There's a song about this. All we need is love. Do, 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 do. So we need love. So who will give us love? The devotees can give us that love. They are the representatives of the love. But the uh, enjoying spirit has to be checked always because it is always there, ready to destroy the entire relationship. So usually the way to love the devotees is to serve together, chant together, hear together. 
and that way Krishna is always in the center. Krishna has to be in the center of all the relationships. Husband, wife, mother, son, counselor, counselee. Krishna has to be in the center. Prashanta, it's more than the attachment. Uh, uh, it's the aversion part that is frightening. That, you know, you have uh, so much like, you know, they're good standing devotees, you know, uh, but you have so much aversion. That's the one I really wanted you to uh, explain to me. And you aversion, also know. Yeah. Okay, aversion is also a problem. Uh, not to like certain devotees and so on. It's very dangerous. It's kind of offensive and it's very dangerous. And oh, the point is always that if Krishna accepts them, how can I, who am I to stand in the way and have a different opinion? Sometimes you see somebody is a temple devotee somewhere and he's doing this nonsense, that nonsense. It becomes known and, you know, sometimes you come to know that something is not right with such and such person. They're doing this, they're doing that or somebody directly does something which hurts you, right? And then is there, why does Krishna allow this person to stay in the temple? Why does that, why, why, why does Krishna, you know, we, we can't tolerate that person, how can Krishna tolerate? But that we should see the other ways, that Krishna is tolerating, how can I not? How can I rebel? Our hatred for people is, is hatred for Krishna. It, it is a rebellion against his will. And it is a desire to control. We think we know better. We think that we know what needs to be done. We know who should be set straight. But that's not the case. Because we are, Prabhupada explains we are all in a wash, washing machine, right? We all have an art and uh, usually we don't see our own and we see everybody else's. But Krishna sees everything, including ours. And sometimes we need to suffer. Sometimes we need to be ridiculed. Sometimes we need to get a bitter lesson uh, because there is something that we need to learn. And so Krishna is going to use somebody as an instrument to trouble us. So the question is always, uh, am I going against Krishna's will? Because when sometimes there are like cases of abuse, or take any action. So you can go ahead and take action with the management. You can take action even with the police. But Dresha, no. No Dresha. That should not be there. Krishna is not enemical to anyone, even to the demons. Krishna is not even enemical to the demons. When he kills the demons, it is for their benefit. Krishna is favorable to everyone. And that's, that's, that's his most attractive feature, that there, there is a, a chance for me, who am such a demon, that he will not turn against me, in spite of me hating the whole world. This hate, it is part of the demoniac mentality. So we have to purify it by chanting, by serving, by praying, and by serving the devotees, including those that we don't like. We have to try very hard to remove that weed from our heart because that is not pleasing to Krishna. Because we may look like a good person in this lifetime, but we're not so good. Otherwise, we would have gone to Vaikuntha. We didn't go. So who knows what nonsense we have done in our previous life to uh, take one birth again. We are not fully aware what kind of rascal we are. 
really. We are not fully aware. We are walking around Tulsi in the morning. Oh, Srimati Tulsi, we just by circumambling you, one becomes free from the murder of a Brahmin. I started thinking, have I ever killed a Brahmin? But who knows what we have done in our previous lives. So today we see someone who is exhibiting some qualities that are not very uh, palatable. Huh? Um, and we become hateful of that person or someone is causing us trouble. Basically, that person is frustrating my sense gratification. That's what is happening. That's why I don't like it. So it, it, it's difficult, and that we understand. But it has to be controlled. And we have to pray to Krishna for the vision of love and compassion. We need to have compassion in the, in the heart. People are acting helplessly, just like us when we do something wrong. It's not that we want to do it, but you know, you will read after some time, Kama Esha, Kroda Esha. It is born from that spirit of enjoyment. So when one does some ugly things, uh, it, is, it is out of their own desire to enjoy. And when we hate that person, it's because they are frustrating our enjoyment. So it is the same thing. Are we superior or inferior? Are we equal? In my opinion, we are equal. Thank you. Hari, Hari. Uh, Thank you very much. I, I like the point when you said that we have an aversion towards them because they are... Uh, putting a bung in our enjoyment. That's why we have an illusion. This is something very deep and we fail exactly. to understand that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we exactly. have, to, have to go deeper inside to understand. Mm -hmm. um, I, there are no questions on the chat and as people are uh, thinking about that, okay, there is a question. Can any desire be related to Krishna? Yes, in general, all desires should be connected to Krishna. Yes. So then, then that is an attachment, isn't it? Because they, we are not supposed to have any raga, any dvesha. We are not supposed to have any attachment. So if all our activities are, are uh, circumvented um, around Krishna, and we are attached to that. So is that attachment legitimate? Yeah, this is the beginning of the practice of Krishna consciousness, to dovetail, it's called, Prabhupada used that word, to dovetail everything in Krishna consciousness. You know, I'm attached to eating ice cream, so I open an ice cream parlor and I offer the ice cream to Krishna. And then I eat, Prasanna ice cream all day long. <laughs> the fact is I am attached to ice cream, but I offer it to Krishna because I understood that my design should be connected to him. So slowly, I, slowly, slowly. But the idea is that when we connect our designs to Krishna, initially the attachment is there. But because we come in contact with Krishna, Krishna is the supreme purifying agent. So gradually, gradually, our attachment will shift to him. He's sweeter than ice cream. So the attachment will shift to him and the, we will lose attachment for other things. That, that is the magic of, of Bhakti Yoga. And it happens usually very fast. You can see people who come to Krishna consciousness uh, Within a short while, you know, they follow four regulative principles, which they didn't even know about those principles before. They might have been drinking whiskey, they might have been smoking dope or cigarettes, they, they were having uh, illicit affairs with multiple people sometimes, they were uh, gambling, and then suddenly they come to Krishna. 
and uh, and within a very short time you can see that most of the people really within months or within six months within one year they're completely transformed so this is the superiority of bacteria so if we have material attachment we try to offer the result to Krishna and we try to dovetail them, connect them with Krishna. And then the, 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 we become purified. Like Griyastas, for example. Okay, there is some attachment to sex life. If there is no attachment to sex life, why get married? <laughs> so some attachment is there. But then, you know, Krishna wants Krishna conscious children. Krishna wants that there, are, there be some people in this world who become parents and train those souls who did not quite make it in the previous life. They now come back. They need a Krishna conscious home. They need a Krishna conscious mother, a Krishna conscious father. So this is how the desire to have children becomes connected to Krishna by educating the children, taking care of them and educating them in Krishna consciousness. And for those who do that, then after 20 years, 25 years, there is no more desire for any mundane relationship or any mundane association. The desire is gone. It has been burned uh, by doing the desires in Krishna consciousness, by acting for Krishna. So initially, you were not completely acting for Krishna. There was some attachment. But then you practice and learned that these are Krishna's children. And you have to you know, educate them, teach them the Bhagavad Gita, turn them to Krishna, teach them how to offer obeisances. You have to lead them to Krishna. And by doing that, you purify the original desire, which was not really for Krishna, but ultimately everything becomes purified in connection with Krishna. So this ice cream parlor was a, um, a desire uh, for raga, but what about karela sabji? For example, if you don't like karela sabji, then uh, you say, ah, Krishna doesn't like karela sabji, so we should not make it for him. So what about dvesha? <laughs> you know, there is a variety in this material world. Um, it's like this for a devotee, is that if he goes, he visits a temple somewhere, and the only prasada, maha prasada, he gets is karela sabji, and he happens not to like karela sabji, um, at least the minimum is that the devotee will honor the prasada. He will you have to get over what you like and what you don't like and at least you will eat a little bit of it you will respect it you will honor it and if eating karela makes you vomit which can be when it's very bitter you just take a little bit and distribute the rest so so in one sense you go you get over your aversion because you yeah, it's prasanam, it's maha prasanam, and you're not going to get any other maha prasanam. That's the one the Bujari gave you. So, you know, what do you want? Like, if you really love Krishna and you want Krishna's mercy, then you have to accept it. But at the same time, it doesn't mean you have to eat one kilo of it. <laughs> because devotional service is not about quantity, it's about quality. So if you gratefully, respectfully accept the prasada, Krishna will be pleased. You don't have to accept the whole bag of no, just take a little with full appreciation and gratitude, and Krishna will be pleased with that. Um, and I, I want uh, to say also name? I, I wanted to say also that hmm. there is a variety in this world. You know, we are all individuals. And so there are differences. There are differences materially. There are differences even spiritually. 
Some people are more advanced, some people are less advanced. And some people like Karela Sabji, and some people like me, they prefer the um, avocado salad. <laughs> we know who. So it's, it's allowed, it's allowed, you know, uh, to, to uh, have some taste in this world. You cannot avoid, like, we are not impersonalists. Impersonalists, they only eat preferably kitchery without salt. So we are not impersonalists, and it's okay to have some taste. Everybody likes more or less. Shula Prabhupada loved, you know, eggplant cookie. So he loved kachoris. So there's nothing wrong with having an individuality. What is wrong is when you indulge, overly indulge in eating, you know, three kilos of kachoris and this and that, then you're going overboard. But to have a little taste for this, a little taste for that, Krishna will appreciate that, you know, that you like, you like him. You prefer when he's sweet than when he's bitter. Okay, fine. So we are allowed individuality. Hare Krishna Mataji, now questions have come up. Oh. Okay, we have a question from Colin Skiprotich, Deva. Uh, Hare Krishna Mataji, nice to see your infectious smile. My question is, one situated in Krishna consciousness, transcendental service and love for Krishna, is there anything called attachment and aversion? So once you are Krishna consciousness, can you have Raga and Dvesha? Uh, raga, for sure. Raga is the component of bhava bhakti, meaning loving devotion to Krishna is based on raga, attraction to Krishna, attraction to Krishna's beauty, attraction to the way he deals with his devotees, attraction to his deep intelligence. So, yeah, spiritual life is based on raga. Because again, we are not impersonalists. Not that we have to completely, not that we have to destroy raga. No, it's, that is not the philosophy. The philosophy is you divert the raga from material objects to the transcendental object, Krishna. So attraction, uh, attraction for the Supreme Lord, and that is very much wanted. And Dvesha, in one sense, it's like Prabhupada said, like, to, for example, Prabhupada said we should be afraid of Maya. So devotees don't like anything which is not Krishna conscious. So in one sense, they have a, you know, a sense of unwantedness. in that sense. So we are attracted to Krishna and we are not attracted to Maya. That is when I say we means the advanced devotees are attracted to Krishna and they are repulsed or they are not attracted to Maya. So it is reversed, you understand? So Bhakti Yoga means quickly learn how to reverse these two. And as soon as we develop attraction for Krishna, then immediately uh, the rest diminishes, the attraction for other things diminishes. That you ask any devotee, so when is the last time you went to a disco? And the devotee was like, Disca? Dikwa? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> what is it exactly? <laughs> I don't remember. I don't think about it. I never think about it. When is the last time you had a tea, you drank tea, you know, this fanta fantastic chai, garam chai, garam chai that we get in India. When is the last time you had a chai and you're like, um, that was a long time ago. And you never miss it? No. I don't, no. I don't think about it. It's gone. Krishna took it away. He took the attachment away. He took it and... 
the path of bhakti is such path that is not the painful um, it is not the painful path it is the path of ananda krishna doesn't take away he gives he gives faith for mahaprasada and you develop so much taste for mahaprasada that you don't care for mcdonalds it's so tasteless it gives you like maha kheer who cares for chai when you get kheer so krishna doesn't take away things from us it just the things just naturally go because he fills us with something else he gives us that is the beauty of prema bhakti as opposed to gyan in gyan you have to give up this you have to give up that you have to give up everything you have to eat very austerely we have to dress very austerely you have to live very austerely there's nothing like this in krishna bhakti Okay, Mataji, there is a question from Sita Takurani. What is Hare Krishna, Sita Takurani? Uh, and uh, she's asking, what is the easy and ready way to take the onus of unpleasant situation in our lives? In spite of practicing Krishna consciousness sincerely in our capacity, material desires for Dhananjaya, Janam, etc., not reducing. What shall I do? Ah, uh, well, sometimes it gets slow. Sometimes it gets fast. <laughs> uh, Prabhupada recommended association. We have to make sure we have the right association. We should not remain alone and we should seek association. That's one of the first things that Prabhupada recommended. Uh, because association is the thing that would change our heart. Association means that uh, we become influenced by the qualities of another, by the desires and the qualities of another. And Prabhupada said very clearly that Bhakti Yoga has to be practiced in the association of devotees. And one has to be intelligent enough to select one's association. So that's, that's one thing which is very important for advancing in Krishna consciousness is this. Hearing is also very important, that we have to hear um, the philosophy of Krishna consciousness. We have to read the Bhagavad Gita, we have to read Srimad Bhagavatam, we have to hear classes, and not just once in a while, but practically every day. And Bhakti Siddhanta Sarvati used to say this thing that you should beat the mind with shoes. <laughs> What did he say with shoes and with stick or something? Once in the morning, upon waking up, bang, 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 before sleeping, bang, 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 you have to beat the mind. And so are we doing that? We have to see. And uh, we have to pray to Krishna. You know, sometimes it's like Krishna lets us swim a little bit, you know. There are periods in our life when everything seems so bright and so positive and we seem to be doing so well and it's so easy to get up early in the morning and to chant and to do service and as you say, this janam, danam, all this doesn't seem to be there. And then after some time you go through another period and oh my God, everything becomes so complicated, so difficult, you're like, you are like walking through the muddy field, you know, and your feet are sticking to the ground. And it's like when you wear boots, you know, the boots stay in the, in the mud. So sometimes there are periods. So we must understand that 
it's not that we are walking backwards. It's not that we have regressed, but it's like we have come to a certain point where you have to purify something. And so Krishna is, you know, he's indicating something is not right. And he, it, it will remain like this as, as long as we don't internalize exactly what is it, what it is. Either through our own reflection or by the association of the devotees, we have to see what is it there, you know. But the most important when we go through troubled time is not to turn against Krishna because many devotees, they turn against Krishna in time of difficulty, in time of death of a relative or when there are such hard times sometimes, you know, that I prayed and prayed and prayed. Like recently we had this very terrible example of, uh, uh, maybe not an example, an incident, an event of Bhakti Charu Maharaj leaving his body, right? And some of the devotees, not some, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people were praying and praying and praying, and mostly depending on what level they were at. Those who are most more advanced know that, oh Krishna, if you so desire, because we cannot decide really. We don't know what is beneficial for the world, for Maharaj, what is most beneficial. You know, our vision is like, uh, from the point of view of one tenth, uh, thousands of the tip of the top of the hair, this is our angle of vision. So we don't know what's right, what's wrong, what's good, for, what's bad, we have no clue. So we have to surrender to Krishna's desire. But at that time, what happened is that many people, of course, prayed and prayed to Krishna, please keep him, keep him, keep, don't let him go. You know, return him back to us and keep him and keep him. And, um, and then Krishna decided otherwise, and he took him away. And uh, I personally witnessed that some of the people who had thus prayed, they turned against Krishna. They turned against Krishna. And one day I was phoning one devotee and I was saying, oh, I'm, you know, I'm just phoning because I know you must be in pain. And, uh, you know, I said, you know, you must, you know, I said, well, Krishna took him away. And the answer was shocking that came on the phone. Is that what Krishna? Where is Krishna? There is no Krishna. Where is Krishna? Oh, that was the reaction. So we have to be very wary of wanting Krishna to do the things that we want. Of, we have to be very careful with that. We don't know what's right, what's wrong. And if Krishna puts us in trouble, we should not say, why are you doing that to me? And or why and how and I don't deserve it and no, it's not that. This is a position from the point of view of false ego, a complete rebellion against the Lord, which is the very reason for which we are here in the beginning. To begin with, we are here because of our rebellious spirit. So whatever happens in our life, we should really like go deep within ourselves and understand it is for my good. Now, how many years it's going to take me to realize how good it was? <laughs> you know? But I have seen that myself in my own life, sometimes going through something really difficult. But then after seven years, eight years, ten years, I realize, wow, now I can speak like this with full realization because I've gone through it. I've gone through that grind. So... Krishna is never mean and he's never against us. He is the perfect teacher. And whatever he gives us is a medicine. So sometimes we get sweet medicine, sometimes we get bitter medicine. So we have to maintain our faith in him. That is the most important. And we have to develop, today we were here in a class in the morning on gratitude. We have to remain grateful. Thank you, Krishna, that it's not worse. You know, that's the first thing. <laughs> it could be so much worse. <laughs> it could be so much worse. 
I mean, some people in this world have it really bad. Is it really bad, my situation? And we have to see things in perspective. Okay, I may be tortured inwardly, something's there, but we have to remain faithful to Krishna and we have to continue, um, as it said in the, what is it, Lord Brahma, hmm? says this, that one who understands that whatever suffering comes in my life, they are due to my own deeds. Atma Kritam Vipakam. They are self-made by me. And I should continue, and instead of accusing the Lord of torturing me, I should beg for his forgiveness for all the torture I have given him and others. It takes a little change of consciousness, and that's why it requires association. It requires a lot of prayer, and it requires association. But uh, in general, uh, in the issue of Anishad, Srila Prabhupada writes this memorable sentence that the miseries of material existence are meant to remind us of our incompatibility with matter. I like this sentence very much. The miseries of material existence are meant to remind us of our incompatibility with matter. Because the fact is that we are not convinced that I am not this body. We are not convinced that science gratification is not the way to self-realization. It's so ingrained. So Krishna sometimes has to screw a little bit. And we suffer. We suffer. But from that suffering will emerge a higher understanding of Krishna consciousness. From that suffering will grow a stronger faith and determination. When it's easy to chant, you wake up in the morning and for three hours. And then comes the time when you wake up in the morning. Uh, okay, okay, okay. I'll chant later. <laughs> That's a different phase of your life. Now, when you chant, in spite of that unwillingness of the mind, sometimes unwillingness of the heart, now that is real chanting. Krishna will note that. That in spite of all that rebellious mind, because sorry, but I'm not the mind, you see. So when you stick to your service, you stick to your duties, you stick to your sadhana as much as you can, because sometimes it can become very difficult. But when you endeavor to stick to Krishna, that is when you attract him. That is when you think he is far, but he is very close. There is this story, I don't know if I told it already here, that's amazing. The other day I actually searched for it on the internet and I found it. The story of, uh, I think it's a Christian story, but the story of the footprints in the sand. You ever mm. heard of the footprints in the sand? Mm. Yes. I always meditate on this. It's a person who... Uh, kind of uh, sees his, his life in a dream and he, he sees footprints in the sand. Mm -hmm. And what he sees is that uh, corresponding to good periods of his life and difficult periods of his life. And when there were good periods in his life, he saw in the sand on the beach two sets of footprints and he knew that I was walking with Krishna hand in hand. And then when there were difficult times, suddenly he saw there was only one set of footprints on the beach. So he started telling Krishna, why did you abandon me? 
when I needed you so much, when I was in so much trouble, where were you? And then Krishna answers, you see, these footprints, these single footprints, it's not yours. It's mine. For at that time, when you struggled, I carried you. I think it's such a beautiful uh, explanation that when we are in difficult phases, we should know that Krishna is carrying us. Otherwise, it could be so much worse. So let us always meditate on Krishna. See, when we meditate on Krishna, everything is fine. So we have to struggle for that. But the struggle is worth it and the struggle is noticed by him. Love you, Sita Thakurani. <laughs> Perhaps um, that is why Kunti Mataji always asked for dukkha, some form of dukkha in her life, so she could be carried by Krishna. Right, but Prabhupada said, no need to ask for more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have enough. <laughs> we have enough. <laughs> there is another um, question from a very young devotee, and she is asking... Um, uh, is chanting for liberation a material desire? Chanting for liberation. Um, chanting for liberation is usually uh, born from the mode of goodness. You may chant to satisfy material desires that's born from the mode of passion. Um, you may chant sometimes for some wrong, completely wrong reason, or you may not chant. <laughs> that is born from the mode of ignorance. And usually the mode of goodness gives a desire for liberation. The mode of goodness is um, attached to jnanam, knowledge and knowledge implies the understanding of a higher goal and the desire to achieve that higher goal so superior to chanting for liberation is chanting in love for krishna uh, chanting just to communicate with him to be with him that is transcendental chanting so chanting for liberation um it is not the perfect kind of chanting, but it is in one sense superior to chanting for sense enjoyment. Um, can I acknowledge some of the uh, devotees who have come on the Zoom, like Kalpana said, she's an anesthetic doctor in Nairobi, uh, she joined a few, a few times, but she never stayed, even today joined late. So Kalpana Hare Krishna, thank you very much. And Prashanta, you should get introduced to Lavanga, who you never met. Lavanga is there on, um, uh, on the video. What? Yeah, on the video. So say Hare, he's one of our very old African devotee. And he's come to help me in Eldred so I can go to Nairobi for two, three weeks. Lawrence also came to Eldred during Janmashmi to do the Kirtan. And uh, Kiprotich, who was in Eldred, he's gone to Nairobi. And uh, of course, you know who is there? Pundrik Prakash Vaita is there. You know, that's Pundrik. Anyway, so uh, Kritika can wind up, but this is my personal thank you to Kalpana especially, Kalpana said, she's a very regular uh, who comes on every Sunday with beautiful saris. Miss not seeing her on Sundays in Nairobi. But thank you. Kalpana, show your pretty face. Kalpana, you there? Kalpana, shade. Yes. Anyway, Lavanga, 
Show your show yourself to Prashant. Hare Krishna. Is it there? Yes, come is there. there. And Kalpana uh, is also there. Mataji. Oh. And they both are waving. So. Kalpana, Kalpana great. I can't see because. Welcome to uh -huh. the. Uh, Dr. Kautna Shet and Lavanga Prabhuji. Lavanga Prabhuji taught me Jeev Jago. So that was my first kirtan that I ever learned. So I'm also <laughs> indebted to him. Okay. That is Prabhupada's magic. Yes. We are both Even. happy to sing one day and record it for Krishna's pleasure. That is our dream one day. Okay, let, let's are go back. Uh, let's go back to the questions. Uh, we have. Oh, there's still more questions. Can I acknowledge hello. Dr. Priya? Hello, hello. It's 10 30 on my side. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so then there were questions, uh, but we can, uh, I think we will close it because it's 10 30 and we don't want to give. Yeah. Any um, I will, what I'll do is um, uh, copy these questions down. So next Saturday when you come, we, these questions will be taken first because we don't want to disadvantage uh, um, the devotees that have asked. So uh, thank you very much, Mataji, uh, for joining us and giving us the, your precious time. Sorry for not realizing it is 10.30 there. I hand over to uh, Path Prabhuji. Path Prabhuji, question. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Thank Hare you, Mataji. Thank, thank you, Mataji. We are sorry we cannot control our time. It is excess. It's too much for you. But we are still enjoying your lecture. Uh, we'll be waiting for you the next Sunday. The next Saturday, please. So, whatever it may be, we will continue that one. So, for a glorification of Prashanta Mataji, please unmute yourself, everyone, and chant Hare Krishna Mantra once. So, Chalo Hare Krishna Prashanta Mataji, please, everyone. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. हर ग्रेस प्रसन्न माता जी की जय सेल प्रभुपाद की जय वंशा कल्पतरु भेष्य कृपा वंशा कल्पतरु भेष्य कृपा नमः बाब ने भी अवश्य भी भी और नमः नमः थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू वेरी मच फॉर योर एसोसिएशन नाइस टू सी यू ऑल एंड वी विल सी यू नेक्स्ट सैटरडे कृष्णा विलिंग Thank you. I've saved the question, so we have to meet next week. Okay. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Jai. Jai. Go, Ranga.